I've seen in the last lecture. So we, we, we finally got the machinery that's needed to uh, compute scattering amplitudes in quantum field theories. So in particular, we looked at um, nucleon scattering. So two nucleons scattering into two other nucleons. And uh, we computed this S matrix. And we computed to leading order, which was uh, order G squared. And we got the following result. Times by. prime minus p. Okay. Good. So, so a couple of things to say about this. Firstly, there's these plus i epsilons that sit on the bottom here because this was the definition of the Feynman propagator. But notice that by the time we've got to this expression, we're not integrating over anything here anymore. And actually, what sits on the bottom is never going to diverge. Okay, So it's never going to be 0, so the whole thing's never going to diverge. So we can just cross these things out. We don't need those plus i epsilons anymore. Epsilon was always to be thought of as something which was infinitesimally small. So they, they, they just vanish. That, that's typically true for any tree-level amplitude you want to write down. It's not true um, for loop integrals. When you do loop integrals, you'll typically still have to integrate over some momentum, and you've got to keep those i epsilons in. Okay? But for tree-level amplitude, you can usually just, just forget about it. Um, we'll compute lots of amplitudes of this type, and they all come with a factor of 2 pi to the 4 times the delta function, which just tells you that, uh, um, that the sum of the incoming and outgoing momenta is conserved. So in writing down the amplitude, we'll just, not, we'll just define this bit and this bit to be the amplitude and just, just remove this. Okay. So we'll define the amplitude uh, by stripping off this momentum. So in general, some initial state going to some final state is always going to have a 2 pi to the 4 times some delta function where this is the sum of the final momenta. And this is the sum of the initial momenta. Okay, and it's, it's this thing here that we're going to call the amplitude. AFI. There, there's an, a factor of I here, this factor of I is in some sense purely conventions, but it's there so that this amplitude agrees with similar things you would compute in uh, scattering theory of non-relativistic quantum mechanics, which you've done already. Okay. Are pure states normalizable? Uh, so saying a pure, like, a pure momentum state <coughs> in non-relativistic quantum mechanics would be not actually part of the space. Is the same thing true with? Yeah, exactly the okay. same. So this actually, this is, if you integrate over several momenta, which is what you have to do for things to make sense, then mm -hmm. the right-hand side makes sense as well. And gets yeah, good, good. Okay. So I, I'm going to come to that question. Actually, I'm going to duck that question later in the lecture. So let me wait. And, and I'll
Oh, that is bad. Okay, so, so this is in general what we mean by the amplitude. Um, your homework this week is just going to be to compute a whole bunch of amplitudes of this type in this theory, and I think maybe apply to the four theory as well, which will relate to the case. Um, let me just give some examples. <coughs> you know, once you've got the Feynman rules, it, it's really dead easy just to write these things down. Um, in the homework, I think for a couple of them, you're, you're going to have to go through Wick's theorem and just convince yourself that the final rules give what they're supposed to give. Um, so, other. Uh, so, we could consider. Um, Nucleon and nucleon scattering goes to two mesons. What are the diagrams for that? These are the mesons, these are the nucleons. This is the nucleon, this is the anti-nucleon, which you can tell because the arrows are going the opposite way. So this is psi and this is psi bar. Okay. So what, what's the amplitude for this? Well, we just use our fine minerals. There's um, uh, two vertices, so it's those is g squared. And now the only really real difference between what we had before is that uh, the propagator that you have in the middle here is the propagator for um, uh, the nucleon instead of the propagator for the meson. So there's a capital M at the bottom instead of a little. Another process is meson scattering. Two mesons goes to two mesons. Uh, the kind of diagrams we can draw for this are a little more complicated now. So we have two mesons coming in and two mesons going out. So who can think of what the simplest diagram we can draw is that connects two mesons to two mesons other than just connecting the lines? Nima. Crossing. Crossing. You mean you mean like this? Yeah, but it, there's no vertex here, so so that really means it's going up and over, and that's the same diagram. It's just nothing, nothing happening. Um, you know, in, in a different theory where there would be a phi four four term, then, then that would actually be a vertex where you would have to put in an interaction. In this theory, mesons don't couple with <laughs> the mesons. The only vertex we have to play with is. Like this, the meson coupling to two. Yeah. Didn't you have like um, meson with a loop? Yeah, good. So, so this is <coughs> this is the kind of interaction that we have to write down. So, for meson scattering, mesons to two mesons, there's no tree level diagram. The, the first correction comes with, the first contribution comes with. Them. <coughs> to write down, um, To write down the amplitude for this, I can just use the final rules again, but I have to be a little more careful. Um, remember, this momentum is coming in, and this momentum is, is coming out. And then I'm going to have to uh, pick an arbitrary momentum on one of these, these sides. So let me just pick this side. So let me say there's a momentum K running here, but then I've got delta functions of each of the places. So the delta functions dictate where the momentum are on the other sides. So in particular here, we've got a k minus p2 prime, because p2 prime went out that way. Here we've got a k 
plus P1 prime minus P1. And here we've got a K plus P1 prime. Okay. And the reasons these are the same are because the sum of all the momentum is equal to zero. It's kind of squeezed uh, down the bottom here, but basically it's a product of four factors. Each of the factors is, is the momentum squared minus the capital M squared plus I epsilon, and they're all multiplied together. Okay. Yeah. Can I? No, I don't know. <laughs> what if we had assigned arbitrary momenta to each one of those inner uh, internal lines? And then wouldn't the delta functions take care of? Okay. Yeah, but then, then it would be then you'll be integrating over four different momenta with with a bunch of delta functions. Yeah. And you do those but integrations using the delta functions and you'll get okay. Right, but that's like the, the formulaic algorithmic way to do it is just to <coughs> just to do that, right? Like A1 and K2. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, yeah. So you're you skip steps. So I've 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 skipped Okay, I've skipped you're steps. Just, yeah, do sorry. Okay. Yeah. But if you did this computation the way well, without skipping steps, you would have four delta functions, and then you integrate only three times to get to three. <coughs> so you should get a delta function in at, in the end. Yeah, the delta function you would get at the end would, would be the, uh, the sum of all of them equals equals zero. It would be the overall delta function, and and that's what we've stripped off when writing down this algorithm. So, so the, the actual f s minus 1 i comes with the delta function, but I just removed it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> oh, good. So, do, do we. Um, let me see. I think, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Plus. Plus. Okay, so, so you can see that, that when you do these one loop integrals or one loop diagrams, you're left with an integral. And it, it looks pretty nasty, right? It doesn't look like it's obvious how to do it. Um, this integral, at least, is going to converge. You notice that these integrals, you usually have problems with high momentum. That means that when the, the k gets large. So you, you basically got, got to be 4k here, but you've got eight powers of k squared. <coughs> On the bottom, so it's an integral of d4k over k to the eight, and that and that converges. Okay, so we're we're at least good there, but you've still got to do the integral, and there are techniques to to do these integrals that you'll learn. I'm not sure which course, but I'm sure at some time over the next few months you'll you'll learn how to do these kind of integrals. Okay, a, a good rule of thumb is is that. Um, is that if, if, if you have to do a one loop integral, you, you should just be able to sit down and, and do it. You know, it, it might not be the, the nicest thing in the world, but, but in any theory you have, you shouldn't be afraid to just sit down and do one loop integrals if, if necessary, like this. The two loop integrals, you know, if you come across these in your research, you really have to have a very good reason to sit down and, and compute these, because it's going to take you a long time and be very painful. Uh, and anything more than that, um, you know, you typically leave to, to experts who just compute these integrals for a for a living. Okay. Nima. This, th this is the <laughs> this is the really order contribution to this, this process. It's, it's order g to the four, so it's it's, it's, it's a, a more suppressed process than, than this. What I mean is that is it possible for one of them to do nothing, absolutely nothing, and the other just decay into two? nucleons and then 
Oh, I see. You're a good question. It's a good question. If you're interested in, in this, yeah. So, so these diagrams are there, and I've been subtly avoiding talking about them. Um, what, what's really happening here is that when a meson moves along in space, it, it's continually doing, doing this. And when you compute the, the corrections to this, you'll find that, that it's infinite. Uh, you have to work out how to deal with that. And there's a very nice physical meaning to what, what's happening here. It, what, 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 what's going on is, is that the meson's moving and constantly splitting into a nuclear and nuclear pair and combining and moving. And that's changing what you observe as the mass of the meson. So this is all to do with this story of renormalization. But the little m that we've been putting in the Lagrangian, which appears to give you the mass, is not the actual mass that you will observe that meson. What you have to do is you have to take into account diagrams like that, that mass gets shifted, and then everything we've said is carries on. But this is really the topic of the next quantum field. So these diagrams are there, but they need something a little bit different that's to do with renormalization. So should you include those diagrams when writing down these amplitudes? <laughs> no, what, what it will do is, it, 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 is change you know, what, what you mean by this, this capital A. Like, actually, not this one, this will change what you mean by little A. So you throw it away, you throw it, you, you think about those diagrams and change M. Yeah, so there, there, there's actually a, you could make this a little more formal, and, and I think this will pass the tutorial session tomorrow, maybe. But the kinds of diagrams you should consider are called connected diagrams, and it's what they, what they sound like. It's where everything is involved in, in the process. So this is a connected diagram because all the external lines are connected, whereas this one isn't. So, so, so there are some caveats to what I've been saying that, um, that we'll be covering in due course, where due course is not listed. <laughs> okay, are there any other questions about, about this? Okay, I, I should say that um, you know in the last couple of years, or may, maybe a little more, that, that there's been lots of progress in understanding how to compute these integrals of, uh, of this type. Not so much in just scalar theories, but in, in gauge theories, which if you don't know what they are, you'll come across them even at the end of this course. But, but theories with uh, uh, spin one particles interacting and also in, in gravitational theories as well. And it sounds like it's going to be really dull, right, sitting down and computing integrals. But what, what's amazing is that in, in certain theories, people do these horrendous calculations, and what comes out is something very, very simple and elegant at the end. Is that a uh, Yeah, so it's, it, it, there's various different approaches to this. Some people just sit down and calculate with brute force. Peop other people, like Freddy Cacciazzo here, together with, with Nima, using twisters. Yeah, so, um, so what, it, what it means, what it means if you're doing a horrible calculation and getting a beautiful answer for a reason that, that you don't know is that, is that you've missed something. You know, that there's, there's some important ingredient that means the whole calculation should have been elegant and beautiful from the beginning, uh, and there's something you don't understand. So, so there is a big research program led by people like Nima and Freddie and uh, Lance Dixon on, on the West Coast and various others, to, trying to understand not these particular integrals, but, but actually I think what they do is they take hard integrals and reduce them to, to this one. Um, but, um, but, you know, th th there's some hidden structure inside this perturbation series that, that isn't really apparent and, and that people still don't fully understand. Um, so it's, it's an interesting area of, of research. Okay. Good. Let me just tell you about a different theory. Uh, this is universally called phi to the four theory, or sometimes lambda phi to the four theory. It's just a single real scalar field. With 
um, a marginal. Okay, probably one. Um, with a marginal coupling, marginal means that, that this is a dimensionless number. Okay, so you just take lambda to be much less than one, and now you've got a, a weakly coupled theory that you can start to compute. Okay, so we've just got this, this interaction. What's the vertex that we now write down when we're doing Feynman rules? It's, it's this, okay? So, so, so now th these guys actually hit each other, and this is the vertex you use to, to join diagrams together, not, not the trivalent vertex that we had in the previous guy. Okay, four legs because it's five to the four. Yeah? If you included the previous correct terms, could you have four types of vertices? Ab ab way? Absolutely, yeah. So if you had a five to the four and that scaling in Carl Watson, you would start having more complicated diagrams. Why not five to the three? Yeah, we could have phi five, five cubed. Um, <laughs> the problem is that phi cubed looks like this. Uh, now, the energy, the potential energy is, this is minus the potential energy. So the potential energy is this plus this. If you've got phi cubed, it's a theory whose energy is unbounded below because it can just, it can just run up. I should say that the same problem is actually there for the scaling of the theory. But it, it, it turns out if you, if you, if you uh, yeah, if, if you plot that potential, the origin is, an is, a, is a minima, but not a global minima. So if you move far enough away in the phi direction, it's also going to be because it's n squared, then, then you can roll off to minus infinity. Um, so it, it's a, a real issue for um, that scaling Yukawa theory as well. And what it means is that you know what I've been looking at is small perturbations around the origin, if you like. And I can't push those perturbations too far, otherwise the theory is going to run somewhere basically the only time. By the way, you ask any cosmologist, they're actually people who live somewhere like this. You know, they'll think about our potential. There's some scalar field in the universe, and it, when we sit in some, some minimum, but not a global minimum, and the, you know, we're just uh, I don't know, 14 billion years away from tumbling through somewhere and, and all dying. You know, that's, <laughs> that, that's, I think what most cosmologists would, most very theoretically inclined cosmologists would argue. The, the reason is that we live in the sitter space with a positive cosmological constant, but any theory you write down typically has. has uh, Possibilities for zero or negative cosmological constants. So we just have to come through. I'm not sure I can. I'm not, just to go back a little bit, I, I'm having a little bit of a Why does a feed to the fourth correspond to a four valence <coughs> infraction? Let, let me. Let me tell you what the Feynman rule is for this, and then explain why that's the Feynman rule, and then at the same time we'll see what, what, what why this is. This is uh, are there any other questions? Okay, so the Feynman rule for this is, remember, whenever you see a vertex, you have to associate a number to the vertex. The number is minus i. That was the same as we had before, times lambda. Now, this is a little different from what we had before because of this four factorial. Why is it lambda and not lambda over four factorial? So, so let me now explain that, and in doing so, I'll also explain why we've got these four, four guys here. Okay, so, so remember, what, what's going on here? Th this is the interaction part of the Hamiltonian. And that means that when we're doing Dyson's formula, we're getting, um, you know, we're, we're sandwiching products of this interaction Hamiltonian between initial and final states and time ordering them. Okay. So, what's the right way to say this? 
So l l let's look at phi to phi scattering in this. In this particular theory, so we've got some initial state, some final state out here, the one over lambda factorial, p1 prime, p2 prime, and what's going to happen is there'll be some there's a factor of the interaction Hamiltonian, so that's phi to the four, and it's going to be time ordered, and then we're going to use Wick's theorem and change that time ordering into normal ordering and pick up some propagators. Okay. So we, we're going to get after Wick's theorem things like, like this. Okay. Now, now the reason there's four guys here is, is basically because there's, th th there's four guys here. And so what, what's going to happen in this case? Each of these has an A and an A dagger sitting in. And so what we want to do is, is, is take an A from two of these and kill these, and then an A dagger from the other two to build up these, and then we'll get something non-zero. Okay? So that's what this picture is capturing for us, the fact that sort of this theory can, can take two mesons and kill them and then produce another, another two. Okay? And, and typically, that, that's always going to be the case. You have you know, some polynomial uh, of fields, sitting here, uh, and you, know, you just count the number of each field that arises, and that's the number of legs on, on the vertex for that. Um, this also tells us what happens to this four factorial. Notice that the way of picking the two that are going to kill this and the two that are going to hit this is four factorial. So, so there's four factorial different ways of killing these and producing these. That cancels this four factorial, which is why we just have a lambda here and not a lambda over four factorial. Baffled looks. Okay, you, you should maybe just sit down and uh, compute this in phi to the four theory. Expand this out in A's and A daggers, and just just see it yourself. And you'll find that it it, it comes out to be proportional to lambda and not lambda over four factorial. Okay. So let me just write it down. There are four factorial ways of picking creation and annihilation operators. So if it cancels this guy here. case because they were distinguishable. Yeah, they were all distinct fields. Like there was a far side, side dagger and a side. Uh, in these things typically well, they only come up <coughs> when you have to deal with There's another point that's similar to this, which, which is that when you're writing down diagrams in phi to the four theory, that this kind of fact that there's various choices about the way you do things raises its head again. Okay? It raises its head only for one loop diagrams and higher. But sometimes the diagram that you write down has, has to come with an extra factor of a half or a quarter or, or something like that. Um, and there is some algorithm for figuring out uh, when you do this and what's required. It's to do with the symmetry of the diagram and these extra factors are called symmetry factors. Um, so I'm not going to go through them here, but you should just be aware that this arises in the phi to the four theory, and we may set a homework exercise where you have to, have to figure this out. If not tomorrow's tutorial, you'll, you'll have to go through and, and, and just see how this, this can arise. Um, so all I'll say for now is just be aware that when you have things like phi to the four where there's the fields are not all, all different, there can be extra factors of two and four that arise in, in Feynman diagrams. You can read about this in Peskin and Schroeder if, if you're interested. And I'm sure one of the other lecturers will also comment on it, probably Peskin. OK, uh, any questions about, about this? No? 
Um, I, I'm actually going to stop talking about interactions now. Um, but what I do want to do is, is, is spend five or ten minutes telling you what I'm not going to tell you, just so you kind of have a, a view about what I'm missing and you know, you know what you don't know, which is sort of half the battle, right? Knowing what you don't know. So then you can figure it out later. Um, so let me mention three things that if we had more time, if I had another lecture or two, I would go through. But because we're short of time, I'm not going to. And I think all of them you're going to see in other, in other contexts. Okay, so, so let me just tell you about this. Okay, so things I'm not going to tell you. Um, so number one, and this is what you're going to do, um, or it's one of the things you're going to do in the tutorial session this afternoon. And it's a really nice physical question. It, it, it's the following. We've computed uh, the amplitude for... Uh, let's say nucleon nucleon scattering in this scalar Yukawa up here. Two psi is good to two psi. So you've got a formula for this, but you know it's not really clear what that formula is is telling us. Um, after all, you know, we, since high school we've had a way of explaining how particles interact. It's it's f equals m a, and it would be really nice to take this sort of fairly abstract formula we've got and translate it into something that we can plug into the f of f equals m a. Right, so really just make contact with standard physics. After all, it, it, it's sensible. We have two nucleons sitting here, and we, we make them go together slowly. You know, if we're sort of a 19th century physicist or an early 20th century physicist, what do we see? We see them go in, and then they, they come out again. Okay? And there should be a way to explain that trajectory in terms of the forces between the particles. Okay? So the calculation to do this afternoon in tutorials is to figure out what that is and to translate that amplitude into a force between particles. Or you know, we're a little more sophisticated in forces, so we'll just have a non-relativistic potential that, that is the, uh, the energy felt between the separation of the particles. Okay. So, so how do we do this? Well, what you have to do is make contact with the non-relativistic scattering calculations that you did in Malcolm's course. So, so you say the following. Pretend that there's the following potential energy between the two particles. What amplitude would I get if I scatter them and then match that amplitude to, to the one we've computed here? Okay. So is, is that clear what we're going to do this afternoon? L let me tell you the answer because it's, it's interesting. Well, I've told you the answer. It's, it's, it's what's called a Yukawa potential. So the answer is that the potential... between two particles. So this is the separation So just, you know, non-relativistic spatial separation between two particles. Sorry, that's not lambda. Ah, that is lambda. Okay, so it's G over 2M. Rem remember, it <coughs> G had dimensions of mass. So G over M is the dimensionless quantity. And I told you that for things to be weakly coupled, G had to be much less than M. And now you can see explicitly that that's true, that that would be a small number if, if that's the case. So a small force between the particles. So it's really saying that these variables can't be Yeah. Another is coming in that scattering often because that's what we do in classical right? Yeah, so so uh, good, good. So yeah, there's a slight change of perspective. 
So usually in classical quantum mechanics, you have some potential here, and you scatter a single particle in the FB. So, so the slight change of perspective is to consider two particles, but their relative separation is the dynamical variance, right? And that relative separation is moving in, in this potential. But can you consider a frame in which the reference frame? I know we're classical. Yeah, you can probably, that's right. You can probably keep one fixed. Okay. No, not really, actually. That, that would have to be a big heavy one, and this, and this a light one. So, so when they're the same mass, it's best just to take yeah. the center of mass degree of freedom and throw it out. So what you're left with is, is a problem for a single dynamical variable and yeah. separation. And so that M is the, the mass of either one of the dynamical variables. Yeah, I think that, that's exactly why there's two M there, because this is right, the reduced mass or whatever yeah. it's called yeah. in the classical mechanics. Um, other questions about this? Okay, so, so this is the kind of potential that, that, that Yukawa suggested back in uh, the 1930s to be responsible for the strong force. And typically, whenever you have in quantum field theory um, in three plus one dimensions, you know, two particles which are interacting by the exchange of a massive particle, the the effective potential they feel is always is always of this form. So the one over R is, is because we're in three plus one dimensions and it's just the usual uh, Coulomb type force. But now it's suppressed by, by this exponential fall off where the exponential gets small as soon as R gets bigger than one over the mass of the particle. Yeah. Is that a potential and then try to find some quantum field theory for it? There, there's various things you throw out to get to this, or at least yeah. the fact that, that you have to go to a non-relativistic limit. Okay. So if you start with a non-relativistic potential, you want to sort of bootstrap up to a relativistic field theory. I don't know if that's always possible. So we probably only include the first order of diagrams. That, that's also so. Yeah. Yeah. Um. One thing I want to stress, uh, there's a minus sign here. Okay, what does that mean? It means that the potential, the potential is attractive, the force is attractive. The human field wants to, uh, wants to come to, together because of this exchange of the particles. Okay. If we did the same calculation for nucleons and anti-nucleons, we'd find exactly the same answer. And this is something we, we, which is important to stress. We, worth sort of checking this afternoon when you go through this, that if you have forces that are due to the exchange of scalar particles, they're universally attractive. <coughs> likes attract and opposites attract. Here we're seeing that the likes attract. Nucleon and nucleon has an attractive. So, 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 so there's a nice uh, um, sort of chain here. Spin zero exchange always gives rise to attractive forces. Exchange of spin one particles is what we mean by electromagnetism, and we'll see this later in the course. And there, of course, opposite attract and likes from hell. So there's a dip in the side. But when you go up again to spin two particles, that's what we mean by gravity. And again, everything attracts. So spin zero and spin two always attractive. Spin one attractive or repulsive, depending on whether you've got particles of the same type or particles. Does it make sense to ask the same question for spin half particle? Um, yeah, no, uh, for, for the following reason, that um, two particles come along, and this guy spits out a spin half particle. What's left carrying along is no longer the same particle. It spins different by, by a half. But if we exchange several spin half particles, or? Oh, good, yeah, so you, you can imagine the uh, <coughs> box type diagrams. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm fairly sure, but diagrams of this type don't give rise to forces of this type. I think there's also sort of, I think things are just more subtle. That there's, there's spin-spin interactions that you have to take care of. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not quite remembering. We, we, we'll talk about calculations like this when we come to spin particles. And, and even there, it's often. Yeah, 
even there it's the case where, where, where this sometimes vanishes and then it's over the next turn. I, I can't fully remember it. To me, it's the answer, but I think about that. To me, it's mostly the potential that's been not particles. I mean, it's more like a, a potential implies a force, right? And the force carrying particles are used to force it with those ones. Right, right but that, that's precisely because okay. you know, it, it changes. But you could, you could consider okay. a, 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 a force like due, due to this. And there should be a potential. But it may be that it's zero in the non relativistic limits, or okay, I'm, not, I'm not sure. It's, it's not Can you take extra diagrams somehow to come up with uh, like relativistic corrections to film slots and this kind of thing? For yeah, a, absolutely. Proton scattering off an electron. That's got a, an electron as the internal line, right? And can't you, is there a potential for that? Or is that just quantum scattering? Well, you could do more interesting photon scattering of photons. Right. Um, but I don't think you can write that in terms of, it's hard to make a photon not relativistic. Okay. Okay, so that, that's the first thing I'm going to talk about. Um, okay, the, the, the next thing I'm not going to talk about is cross sections and decay rates. Um, so th this has a similar flavor to, to the first thing I didn't talk about. It, it's that you know we've got these quantum amplitudes, but what we really want to know is how we're going to compare the things we measure, things we measure at the LHC. Um, uh, and there's a whole extra step there. Of course, you basically know what to do. You take a quantum amplitude, you want to know the probability, you square the complex amplitude. What's what? So, so it, it's basically that step. But there's a few little subtleties along the way. So I think a lot of these subtleties you dealt with in Malcolm's course already, uh, but I'm not quite sure what you did, and it will take a lecture to go through this, and most of it might be repeated, so I'm just not going to mention it. I'm fairly sure that Michael Heskin will, will talk about this in the standard model, so, so you're not going to see it. Um, but I've written a few pages in the notes, so if you're interested, Um, finally, and I, I know you'll come across this more in the next course, um, uh, I'm not going to talk about correlation functions, which are also often known as green functions. Um, so, so let me firstly just tell you what they are, and then I'll stop talking about them. You know, we, we, we developed the machinery to compute the scattering amplitudes in quantum field theory. So answering questions like, I have some particles here and some particles here, and I throw them together, and what's going to come out with what probability? So, so these are exactly the kind of questions that, that you need to ask for particle accelerators. But it's also clear that it's, it, it's it's, it's very much a setup which is is oriented towards high energy particles, and there's lots of other things you could do with quantum field theories where the questions you want to ask have nothing to do with with scattering, at least not obviously. For example, you may come up with a brilliant idea for uh, what happened during inflation in the early universe based on some quantum field theory, and came up with this idea, you want to look at the right, and the thing to check against is the microwave background radiation. And in particular, um, you know, the spectrum of density perturbations over the sky. If you want to do that, you have to know how um, you know, temperature there is correlated with temperature at a different point in the sky. Now, it's not at all clear what you should calculate in terms of scattering amplitudes. What you need is something more abstract, which is called a correlation. So a correlation function, also known as green, green functions, uh, they're sometimes known as endpoint green functions, are the following. Okay, so again, it's a time-ordered product, but it's, it's 
objects in the Hamel, in the Heisenberg picture, now not the interaction picture. And this guy here is the vacuum of the true theory. That, that's a somewhat different object from what we've been calling zero, which was the vacuum of the free theory. Okay? So there's... What I'm not going to tell you about is how you compute things like this in terms of Feynman diagrams. Again, it's all in the notes if you want to go through it. I, and it, it, it's fairly nice, you know. It, there's nice ways in which, uh, in which this gets changed into the other vacuum that we've been considering. But, but basically, this is related to the, the other vacuum by considering all bubble diagrams. So bubble diagrams are things like... Uh, like this. You know, anything that, that's Feynman diagram you can draw with no external legs. So this is somehow the true vacuum here. And, and there's very simple ways to, to compute this. It's really not a hard object to compute using Feynman diagrams. Um, this will be discussed in the next course on quantum field theory, but like I said, it's also in the notes. So, so typically what, what one wants to compute in quantum field theory are not so much scattering amplitudes, but correlation functions of, of this type. Is a is a real function. Real value. Yeah. In this case, yes, if I have complex scalar fields. Uh, no, no, I, I think it, it's a quantum amplitude, so I think it's always. Well, in this case, yes, because these are Hermitian operators, but in general, not necessarily. Yeah. No, even if these are conditional operators, then yeah. it's a complex item. Okay, um, so I've sort of just flagged these things up so, so that you're aware that you know, there's other things out there to learn and hopefully make contact from this. Uh, oh, by the way, some of these issues about bubble diagrams we'll do in the tutorial tomorrow. Um, understand how. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if you want to go into it, but the correlation functions here. Um, like, if you just have a two-point two correlation function, it appears to be fig-dependent. And even worse, it has a... It, it has appears to be what-dependent? Fig-dependent. And even worse, it, it's not just, like, smoothly fig-dependent, but it appears to have a discontinuity when the time ordering of the two points changes. No, the, the, these things will be fully Lorentz covariant. Okay. Um, Heisenberg, these, these things should be fine. Even despite the time ordering or oh, because of the time ordering? Yeah. The time ordering is actually a heuristic okay. thing that we can test and choose that. Okay. Should be yeah. By the way, you asked a question earlier, which I said I would duck. And I have ducked it, but oh, I don't yes. know what the question was. Um, goodness. Oh, right. When you're. <laughs> do you integrate? So if, when you calculate the scattering amplitude for like. Well, pretty much anything you showed, um, you get a delta function on the momenta, and then you uh, sort of, like that shows up in front of every amplitude. So, oh, good, good, good. Thanks. Yeah, I was going to duck in at this point. Yeah. Good. So, 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 so what happens? You take the amplitudes and you, you square them to get the probabilities. But now you've got a delta function squared. Like, so, you, so the amplitude comes with a single delta function, some of the momenta. I would think that you would, because you're, because remember the states you have on either side are not real. Like if they are, you have momentum state, eigenstates on either side, and those aren't real states. So you yeah, have to. Yeah. So, so there's a few different ways to do this. If you just take this, which is equal to i times a delta function, and you square this, you get a delta function squared. Yeah. But one of these delta functions is an honest delta function, which is telling you. Dimensions can serve. The other one is basically delta of zero, which you interpret as the volume of the space time. So you, do, you divide that over here to calculate some probability density. Of the so the, the, 
That's the question I was going to dodge, but that wasn't quite your question. No. So, so your question is that these plane wave states are not normalizable. No, well, it's not normalizable. I'm just saying, like, you don't, it seems like you don't have to play with delta functions at all. Like, if, you, you, because you, the left you could, of course, just yeah. smear this under a wave right. package, just like your quantum mechanics. And then, and then. So is it accurate to say that the left-hand side of the sentence makes sense if and only if the right-hand side makes sense? I think it's accurate to say that delta functions make sense. Well, and we should just. Uh, but you don't need them. They're totally. You, you don't. Irrelevant. You don't need them. But if you want to do without them, you'll you'll have your work cut out for you. Do you? I mean, you can. Can you, it seems like everything here could you, be done you, with. You could smear this with a wave packet. But yeah. Like with a wave packet. You, yeah. Which is what you really have. Just to do this at, at the end. You know, we, whatever you want to do. Is, 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 is you know, the equations that we write down here are typically long and tedious, and when you do calculations, they fill many pages. And you want to find the way to write, to use as less ink as possible to make as few mistakes as possible. Um, OK, so that's me done for interactions. Um, are there any more questions? But by the way, the reason I'm not going to dwell on this, we, we could spend you know, many more courses talking about aspects of interaction. But the real point of this course is to sort of give you the basic ingredients of quantum field theory. So what we have left to do is to understand spin half fields and spin one half fields, and they will come with their own substances. Um, but basically, what we're going to do now is introduce those and, and you know, explain everything we've done so far the same fields. We'll have okay. So let's move on. We're going to um, talk about spin half fields, which. Uh, described by the Dirac equation. So this is uh, section four of the Dirac equation. Okay, so I, I'm going to go kind of slowly. Um, I know Malcolm did the Dirac equation already, uh, but this is one situation where, where nobody else is going to do it. Uh, and I think it's worth ju just going very, very slowly and, and building up to it. And so not just writing it down, but, but seeing you know, why this is the miraculous equation that it is. Uh, so, so I think we won't get to the Dirac equation until the end of tomorrow's lecture. But we're, we're going to understand the Lorentz group a little bit and, uh, and, and figure out why this is such a, an interesting and beautiful equation. Okay. So, yeah, so, so far... We've only considered scalar fields. And under a Lorentz transformation, Basically, what, what happens is, is under an active Lorentz transformation, the field uh, just sort of rotates or boosts, and the new field is the old field evaluated at, at the point in space where you were before you did the active transformation. Okay? That's that lambda to the minus one there. But, of course... The fundamental particles that, that we know of aren't described by, by scalar fields. Um, in fact, we haven't discovered yet a single fundamental particle which is, discovered by, which is described by uh, scalar fields. Hopefully this will change in the next two years, but at the moment, uh, you know, everything um, that we know of, that we believe is fundamental, uh, has an extra property which is a little intrinsic angular momentum that, that we call spin. Which particle were you that you were doing? The Higgs. Oh, the Higgs. The Higgs, oh, sorry, yeah. I, sorry, yeah, I should stress this. The Higgs is a scalar particle. Oh. So in the standard model, the Higgs is the only uh, scalar particle. Okay? Sorry, I, I should have should have stressed that. Okay. So these give this gives rise... Rise to spin zero particles. So to describe fields with spin, sorry, to describe particles with spin, we 
which means the, the particle has some intrinsic angular momentum. What we're going to do is look at fields which themselves have some non-trivial uh, uh, transformation under the Lorentz group. Okay, so what do I mean by, by a trivial transformation? By trivial, that this is changing because the space is changing, but the components of the field you know, aren't doing anything special, and, and that's because there's just one component and it can't really do anything. So an example of a, a non-trivial transformation that you know already is uh, the gauge field of electromagnetism. So the spatial part changes, the argument changes as, as for a scalar field. But now, of course, when you do, say, a rotation, the, uh, you know, the electric field in the x-axis rotates into the electric field in the y-axis. So, so that's what this guy here is, is telling us. Okay, so you might think that the simplest thing to do is now to consider this because it's very familiar, but it turns out that, that quantizing this comes with some pretty interesting and, uh, and difficult subtleties uh, that we'll get to next week. Uh, so instead, it, it, it's best to look at the next one up. So we started with spin zero. It's best to look for spin half. Okay. So what I want to do is try and uh, tell you what a, a spin half field is and how it transforms under the Lorentz group. Okay, so in general, A field can transform in the following way. So you have a whole collection of fields and they're labeled by some index A that runs from one to some unknown number. And under a Lorentz transformation, this set of fields could themselves transform into each other in some way. The way they transform into each other should be a, a matrix. The matrix should depend on which particular Lorentz transformation you're doing, and it should have certain properties. And these properties are such that mathematically we would say that it's a representation of the Lorentz group. Okay, so what does it mean that it's a representation of the Lorentz group? Well, basically, it just uh, reflects all the multiplication properties of Lorentz transformations. Objective representation. Um, I don't think so, but I. Sorry, say again? Yeah. <coughs> so I, I, are there projective representations of the Lorentz group? Oh, I mean, okay. no, <coughs> they may all be trivial. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't think okay, no. there are any, but I'm not. So certainly they don't arise in any physics that come across. Um, yeah, the representations have been classified. I'm sorry, are you, we're asking, we're not, so not doing the representation <coughs> of the molar, like SL2, like of the rotation group, but of the whole, oh, the, of the Lorentz group, yes. Okay, so what happens, I believe, is that, so you could have 
you could need a projected representation of a rent group, but there's some some way in which so SL2C is a double covering of the, the rent group, and there's some there's some way in which like any projective representation of the Lorentz group comes from an ordinary representation of SL2C. So what you're actually doing is finding representations, ordinary representations of SL2C. And when you do the Poincaré group, it's similar. The Poincaré group is the product of the Minkowski preservation group with the Lorentz group. It's a direct product. And you, like, that, that's, that's, that, that. that's I, I think maybe, but nobody knows is, 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 is the answer. Well, um, the answer is, the answer is no. Okay. So, so how do we figure out, oh, I should say a bit more about representations. So, so, so what are we capturing here? We're, we're capturing you know, the, the fact that the Lorentz group is, is a group. You know, a group means I can do one thing, and then I can do another thing, and that's still a Lorentz transformation. And, and so... But by the way, how, how many have seen representation theory of, of, how many haven't seen representation theory of groups? Good, so enough that I, I need to just, just spell this out. Um, so, so, so there's a structure to Lorentz transformations, which, which is exactly what I said. It's this thing called a group structure, but it basically means you do one thing and then you do another thing, and, and that's the same as sort of doing the whole thing in, in one go. It's a very obvious structure, right? I can rotate this way and ro rotate this way, and there's one rotation which, which would take me to that original uh, situation. So, 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 so what I've got here is the fact that um, I want some matrices D, which basically have the same properties as, as the standard matrices lambda that we have to, to describe Lorentz transformations. So in particular, um, for every lambda I want to associate a D, but if I take um, two Lorentz transformations in a, in a row, lambda one, lambda two, there's a matrix D associated to that, which is equal to taking the matrix associated to lambda one and multiplying it by the matrix associated to lambda two. Okay. Similarly here, uh, the inverse of D is D of the inverse Lorentz transformation. And then there's this trivial one that, that uh, uh, D of, if you don't do a Lorentz transformation, th then D is also one. Like, you'd think with the first two axioms, this third one's not Yeah, you could well be. Um, good, so what we want is to find all possible Ds such that, such that this is true. That's what's meant by finding all representations of tolerance. Okay, so, so how do we go about finding this? And, and this is true for any... Um, these things are called lead groups, like <coughs> continuous groups that depend on a, you know, a continuous number rather than just uh, um, you know, a discrete um, uh, transformation. They're, they're, they're called lead groups. And there's a standard technology to understand the representations of all lead groups. I'm not sure, is there going to be a course on this? Uh, OK, good. Um, so there's a standard technology to understand um, the representations of all Lie groups, which is to look at what happens when you make just infinitesimal transformations. Okay? So th this should hopefully be, be slightly familiar from angular momentum in, in quantum mechanics, where you know, angular momentum is associated to rotations, but what you do is you consider making just infinitesimal rotations, and uh, you get operators which obey certain commutation relations that are responsible for these. Okay? Um, so, so to find representations, and again, th this is true of any group, is we look at we look at what's called the Lie algebra. What this means is. Look at infinitesimal transformations. Oh. 
Okay, so, so what's an infinitesimal transformation? We take a Lorentz transformation which is, does nothing, and then something which is small, and by small we mean it's of order epsilon. Okay, so, so these Lorentz transformations are, are special. They have particular properties. The properties of the Lorentz transformations are going to be imposed on the properties of these infinitesimal trans transformations. Okay, so let, let's see what that is. Okay, this is the definition of a Lorentz transformation. We saw this at the very beginning of, of the course. It's Lorentz transformation transpose times Lorentz transformation equals unit matrix, but where unit matrix now has a minus sign because it's the Minkowski. Let's plug this into here. Okay, it's very clear. So, so what, do we, what have we got? Uh, we have the deltas, which are just going to give back this. And then there's the terms linear in epsilon, uh, which are going to be the things that are interesting. And then there's the term epsilon squared, which we're going to forget, neglect. Okay? So what this means is that looking at the terms linear in epsilon, So, so, so this is uh, very simple. We have these Lorentz transformations. If we do an infinitesimal Lorentz transformation, the matrix that we have has to be very special. How is it special? Well, it's, it has to be anti-symmetric. Okay. Notice that I've, I've raised both the indices here, and it's actually only anti-symmetric when both indices are up. That, 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 that's right. So one of these, th this should be a new. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's right. Good. Thanks. Okay, so what we want for, Lore for infinitesimal Lorentz transformations are anti-symmetric matrices. So these are four by four matrices. How many anti-symmetric matrices are there? Well, there's four times three divided by two, which is six possible matrices. And this is exactly what we wanted because the Lorentz transformations consist of three rotations and three boosts. People happy so far. Infinitesimal Lorentz transformations correspond to anti-symmetric matrices. So what we're going to do now is introduce a basis of infinitesimal Lorentz transformations. That is that any anti-symmetric matrix is going to be a linear combination of six anti-symmetric matrices that we, we choose and which I'll now write down. So we'll introduce a basis of six, this one, six, four by four anti-symmetric <coughs> matrices.
OK, so I, I need to explain the, the notation here. Th this is the 4 by 4 matrix labels. Maybe matrix labels is the row column labels of the matrix. Now, this um, is a label that I could have written as, say, capital A that went from 1 to 6. So this is the label that's going to tell me which of the six matrices I've picked. But rather than have a capital A that goes from 1 to 6, I've chosen a row and a sigma, each of which go from 1 to 4, actually 0 to 3. But, but it's anti-symmetric in row and sigma, which you can see here that... that Say rho is 1 and sigma is 2, I get a 1, 2, and a 2, 1. But that's exactly the same matrix up to a minus sign as, as, as 2, 1. Okay. So this labels which of the six matrices I'm interested in. M maybe I'll give some examples and then that will... Uh, that will clarify any confusion. So for example, so, so in particular, there's no M here, which is 0, 0, or 1, 1, or 2, 2. The only Ms that we have are 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 1, 2, 1, 3, and 2, 3. So there's 6. So, so here's uh, two examples of the matrices. All I've done is I've picked 0 and 1. I've plugged it into here. I've plugged it into here. And I've, I've figured out which, which elements are, are non-zero. Okay? So this is an infinitesimal boost in the x direction. Okay, 0 is time. 1 is x. This is basically a Lorentz transformation, infinitesimal Lorentz transformation, which is a boost in the x direction. This, meanwhile, is an infinitesimal rotation around the, the z direction. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's, it's a little bit odd. I've told you I've written down a basis of six anti-symmetric matrices. I gave you an example, and it's not anti-symmetric. So, so, so why is this? It's, it's, it's because, as uh, was just pointed out, the new index sits at the bottom as I've written it. If I was to raise it so there was a mu and a new, I'd pick up a minus sign here, and it would be anti-symmetric. Anti okay? But as it stands, I'll, I'll leave one up and one down. t -bra. Oh, good, good, yeah, so, 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 so thanks. So I, didn't, I guess I didn't want to say those words because people hadn't seen representations, but there are people that have seen representations, so, so I'll say those words. Um, yeah, th this is the Lie algebra element or the generator of the boost. Um, what that means is that the actual Lorentz transformation, as we've, as we've seen, is 1 plus a little small number times this matrix. Okay, so that's what we mean by a generator. OK, so as I said, I've now got a basis of, uh, of these guys. So we can write any infinitesimal Lorentz transformation, or the generator of infinitesimal Lorentz transformation, as a linear combination of these six.
Okay, so, so now come the, the, the final two statements of the lecture, and, and these are going to be the things that um, you're going to have to take uh, on authority if you haven't seen representations of Lie groups before, because I'm not going to be able to, to prove these in this lecture. So hopefully they won't be totally unfamiliar. Um, so the first one is that any finite, and actually there's a caveat to the any, but I'll come to that later. Lorentz transformation can be written by taking this infinitesimal one and exponentiating. Okay, so, so let me just explain the notation before I try and explain what, uh, what, what's going on here. Um, this is a 4x4 four four matrix, the M, but I've not included those 4x4 four four indices. Okay, so there's a mu and a new index which is floating around here and here, which I've just left off, hopefully for clarity. Okay, so this is a 4x4 four four matrix. This is a set of six, sorry, this is a set of six four by four matrices, and this is a set of six numbers. So this whole thing is a given four by four matrix. And then I exponentiate the four by four matrix. Okay? What do I get if I do that? Well, if, if these are very small numbers, I get the one plus the small infinitesimal piece plus higher order term. Okay? So what you need to know about, about Lie groups I is that any element of the group can always be written in this exponentiated form uh, where there's the element of what's called the Lie algebra that, that sits here. So for those who haven't seen Lie groups, this, this may be the tricky thing to, to understand. Okay? But any Lorentz transformation can be written in this form. Um, so again, what are these? These are six numbers that tell me exactly what Lorentz transformation I'm doing. They're the numbers that say, I'm rotating by 30 degrees, or I'm running at 100 miles an hour in this direction. Okay, and these are the six matrices that are implementing that. Yeah, please. So the six numbers, how are they linked? They have two indices. Yeah, they have two indices, but but they're anti-symmetric because they're contracted with this, and the definition of this was anti-symmetric. Yeah, I probably should have written this this on the board, uh, but but if you just look at the definition I gave. It's anti-symmetric. So, so, so it looks like there's 16 numbers, <coughs> but because they're anti, it looks like there's 16 possibilities, but because it's anti-symmetric, there's actually just six. But matrices, you can only get this it, it's, it's exactly the same because anything that's, so suppose that I write down an omega 1, 1. That contracts with m 1, 1, but there is no m 1, 1 and 0. So the only thing that's contributing here is is omega 1, 2, and that's contributing in the same way as omega 2, 1. So there's really just six of these guys. Okay, and there's one final thing you need to know, which is the Lie algebra. So the generators. Oh, but by, by the way, this, this any isn't quite right. Um, strictly speaking, these are Lorentz transformations that are connected to the identity. So, so there's some like just flipping, uh, well, doing a parity transformation, doing a reflection, which you can't get by, by this way. So you have to add a disc an extra couple of, uh, of operations to get the full Lorentz group. We'll come to that later. What does the word finite, I forgot to ask this earlier, what does the word finite oh, I, I, I just mean in in contrast to infinitesimal. So this, this is the finite rotation. Yeah. Oh. This is an infinitesimal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so finally, uh, the Lie algebra <laughs> is the following. So, so you, you can figure this out just by plugging in the definition of the ends. Yeah. 
important equations that make it possible. Okay, so, so again, just to stress, this is a 4 by 4 matrix, and I'm commuting it with a 4 by 4 matrix, but I'm dropping the, the new, new label because there's already enough labels in this equation. But each of these is a 4 by 4 matrix where the row column labels have not been, have been left implicit. Okay, so, so, so let me just um, repeat what, what we've done here. We consider Lorentz transformations, and I've either reminded you or told you that all Lorentz transformations can be written by picking a bunch of numbers which tell you which one you're doing, but basically taking a linear combination of six matrices. Okay, these are the six possible infinitesimal rotation, three rotations and three groups. These six matrices uh, have particular commutation relations amongst them. This is how they, they commute. So each of these is just a constant matrix. It looks abstract, but it's, but it's not. And these actually are ones and zeros in these matrices. Um, the key step is that this equation here encapsulates all that's important about the Lorentz group. Okay. In particular, if you can find some other matrices that aren't the ones I wrote down with ones and zeros that obey these same commutation relations amongst them, you take these new matrices, you put them here, and you're guaranteed to have a new representation of the Lorentz group. Okay? So this might be familiar from, from rotations. Remember, you, know, you, you have sort of what I call finite rotations where you actually you know, do something. But when you come to quantum mechanics, the way you encapsulate rota rotations are in the, you know, the SU2 commutation relations. That rotation of X commutator rotation of Y is I times rotation of Z. Okay? That's what you start looking at. You should think of these in exactly the same way as, as those SU2 commutation relations. Um, so whenever we, uh, we look for representations of Lie groups, what we really do is try to find new matrices that obey these algebra this Lie algebra equation, and then we take those matrices and we throw them in an exponential, and that gives us a representation of the group. So in the next lecture, we're going to find new matrices that obey this relationship, and that's going to give us new representations of the Lorentz group. Is that, is that clear to, to people? Yeah, any questions? No, all good? Okay, coffee.